This is Mr. Hastovic's World History Online Lecture Series, Lecture Number 11, The End of the Cold War and the Collapse of the Soviet Union. The Cold War ended in much the same way it began, quickly and in such a manner that nobody could have easily predicted. What began shortly after World War II with Stalin's aggressive interest in expanding Soviet Russia's ideologies, what had seen the USA and USSR nearly come to blows that could have started World War III over the Soviet blockade of Berlin, the construction of the Berlin Wall, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, what had seen actual wars erupt in Korea, Vietnam, and then Afghanistan over determining whether communism or capitalism, democracy or totalitarianism pervade had ended very quickly and to most unexpectedly. The Cold War was 34 years old when, in a moment that seemingly caught the whole world by surprise, the Berlin Wall was torn down on November 10, 1989. It was 36 years old when, in 1991, the last Soviet Premier, Mikhail Gorbachev, had willingly surrendered his power and position to Russians calling for reform and change and democracy before many people knew it, and before many could even understand it, the Cold War was over. Not with violence or an all-out war, but with the Soviets deciding simply they didn't want to be the Soviets or a totalitarian socialist society anymore. The Soviets simply abandoned their holdings in Eastern Europe and then abandoned their control over the Soviet Union. Ever since the early 1920s, Americans had lived in abject fear of the USSR, afraid of an invasion, afraid of a nuclear war with the Russians, even afraid of their way of life. To just bow out of the Cold War as the USSR did confused many Americans as much as it had made us ecstatic that we were the apparent winners of the war. Since 1991, the Russians have not been our dire enemy. We no longer feared the spread of communism, and there was no other superpower on Earth capable of challenging the economic nor military might of the United States. We have been the sole superpower in the world ever since. But what precisely did happen to the USSR? Why did the Cold War end, and why did it end as it did, with Russia simply calling it quits? Hopefully, you remember to look at the Cold War as a multi-level competition between the USA and USSR. It wasn't just a competition to see who could get to the moon faster or who could possess the most powerful military. It was a political competition to determine which form of government was better, democracy or totalitarianism. It was also an economic competition to determine whether Russia's brand of socialism or the US's relatively free and open capitalistic economy would triumph. By the late 1980s, the winner was clear. Capitalism was the dominant economy, and democracy was the preferred political system. The USSR and the USA were engaged in a decades-long spending race. Which economy could generate more wealth? Based upon the strains the Soviet Union placed upon itself, clearly capitalism was the victor. The first strain the USSR had assumed was having the world's most powerful and the largest nuclear arsenal. As you learned in class, the USSR had tested its first atomic weapon in 1949. Six years later, in 1955, it had 200 such weapons. By 1965, that number expanded to 6,300. One decade later, that number increased by nearly 400% to over 23,000 nuclear warheads. By 1985, near the end of the Soviet Union's existence, it had 44,000 nuclear warheads, the most it would ever possess. Now, on average, to simply store and keep one nuclear warhead ready for use costs about $1 million per year. To do so with 44,000 nuclear warheads meant that the USSR was spending over $40 billion each year just on maintaining the nuclear weapons that it had. This placed a tremendous economic burden on the USSR to protect and prepare weapons that it hoped never to use. The USA was largely to blame for Russia's vast nuclear weapons arsenal. We were the first country to develop nuclear weapons and we therefore had a head start on building up our own arsenal. 
In 1955, when Russia had only 200 weapons, the U.S. had over 2,200 nuclear warheads, 11 times Russia's arsenal. In 1965, we had nearly six times as many warheads as the Russians, 32,400 to the USSR's 6,300. The USSR had been losing the nuclear arms race to the United States well into the 1970s, and the United States had already demonstrated a willingness to use its weapons against enemies in war. By 1990, we conducted almost twice as many nuclear weapons tests as the USSR, and more than the rest of the world combined. If the USSR wanted to avoid being bullied by the USA's nuclear stockpile, if it wanted to deny the US its advantage, Russia had to build up its nuclear arsenal to levels at least as large as our own. In essence, US aggression forced Russia to spend a tremendous amount of money developing and storing its own vast nuclear storehouse. Again, spending untold billions of dollars on weapons the USSR wouldn't even use. The USSR had isolated itself from the West. It didn't want to have its culture or politics influenced by Western ideas or values. That was one of the main reasons why Stalin conquered and occupied much of Eastern Europe, to keep the West out of Russia. While borders may be effective at blocking the movement of people, they often fail at blocking the movement of ideas. Now, Russia's entire economy was geared toward providing for the wants of the nation and the needs of its people. However, it only functioned poorly at best at providing for its people's wants. There were very few consumer products available to buy in the USSR, and they were often of poor quality. While everyone had a place to live and had at least rudimentary health care provided by the state, they didn't really have board games. They didn't have much variety in the form of fashion, and the only art or music that was available to purchase or listen to on the radio was that which the government approved. Especially for Russian youth, who had either heard from family who had traveled to the West, or had met the rare traveler from the West who got the appropriate clearance to travel in and around the USSR, the West seemed like an exotic land that not only catered to your wants, but had more than enough consumer products to satisfy everyone's wants. Pepsi and Coke, which were forbidden products in the USSR, could cost as much as $25 to $50 per 2 liter bottle on the Russian black market. Not so much because these drinks tasted delicious, but because they were Western and therefore forbidden by the Soviet government. People wanted what they couldn't have. Rumors and legends of a place called McDonald's, which sold delicious meat sandwiches and garnished with something known as a French fry, were the stuff of a Russian's dreams. Rock and roll was a Western and American invention, and as such, was not an art form approved by the Soviet Union. Yet, smuggled record albums and cassettes could fetch well over $100 each on the black market. Even though they were illegal, Many Russian teens knew who the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Clash, Pink Floyd, Billy Joel, and Guns N' Roses were. They either heard music that was smuggled in from the West, or were able to pick up Western radio signals if they lived close enough to Western Europe, or even pirate radio stations from within the USSR. Russians were enamored with Western culture, a culture that seemed to cater to what people wanted instead of what the government decided people needed. And these people wanted more. The USSR could not satisfy Russia's wants. Only the West could do that. And if Russia wouldn't westernize willingly, its people would make it do so in other fashions. When the Soviet Union fell in 1991, some of the first things that slipped inside its borders were Pepsi and Coca-Cola. Rock music and its touring musicians, such as Paul McCartney, Billy Joel, and Metallica, all of whom performed in the USSR within a year of the Soviet Union's collapse. And Russia's first McDonald's would open in the capital city of Moscow in 1990, one year before the Soviet Union collapsed. Stalin was the last effective leader the Soviet Union really had. Nikita Khrushchev, who came to power in 1958, five years after Stalin died, only lasted six years as the sole leader of Russia. Khrushchev hated Stalin, 
and tried to remove a lot of Stalin's influence on the Soviet Union, especially the culture of terror Stalin had created decades earlier with its purges. Khrushchev felt that Stalin had steered Russia away from socialism, and Khrushchev wanted to get Russia back on track. He tried to pursue a more peaceful and cooperative expansion of the Soviet Union and communism, but pressure inside and outside of the USSR's borders undermined his efforts. Since most people in the Communist Party and in the USSR's government got those positions because Stalin put them there, they naturally remained loyal to Stalin and his vision of what the USSR should be. When Khrushchev seemed bent on changing the direction of the Soviet Union, he met opposition from many former Stalinists, especially when he wanted to present a less aggressive, more diplomatic face to the world. Militant, hardliner Stalinists would have no tolerance for such behavior. When Khrushchev failed to put nuclear weapons in Cuba, after he backed down from the U.S. blockade of that nation during the Cuban Missile Crisis, his peers in the government had had enough and removed him from power less than two years later. The next Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev, was more like Stalin than Khrushchev, and as such, he threw the USSR and its relationship with the West back to the more aggressive, militant, and oppositional relationship it had once known. Brezhnev ruled the USSR with an iron fist and an active secret police, known as the KGB, for 18 years, from 1964 through 1982. In that time, the USSR engaged in a dramatic, rapid buildup of both its conventional army, which would be the largest on Earth by 1975, and its nuclear weapons stockpile, which overtook the USA's by the late 1960s, making the USSR the world's largest producer of nuclear weapons ever since. Brezhnev also got the Soviet Union engaged in a brutal and bloody long war with Afghanistan, which began in 1979 and wouldn't end until many years after his death in 1987. Many historians refer to the USSR-Afghan war as Russia's Vietnam, because even though the USSR had vastly superior firepower and their weaponry was far more advanced than the relatively primitive Afghans, the Afghan style of guerrilla warfare plus secret aid and weapons supplied by the US allowed the supposedly weaker Afghan people to not only avoid defeat, but to draw out the war to over eight years in length and cost Russia untold hundreds of billions of dollars and tens of thousands of lives to fight. By the time Brezhnev died in 1982, Russia was spending half of all of the money it made solely on supporting its military. He made no social reforms of note and had done next to nothing to make living in the USSR any better. But it did have the most dominating military power in the world. After Brezhnev's death, Russia quickly saw two more Soviet premiers come and go. Yuri Andropov and Konstantin Chernenko both died after spending less than a year in office. As such, they did little to change the USSR, nor help in finding ways for it to earn money to not only fund its increasingly expensive military, but also to develop the products and reforms that Russians had wanted. The US president at the time, Ronald Reagan, only made things more difficult for the Soviet Union and its poor leadership by taking a very hardline stance against communism. Reagan announced early in his first term in office in the early 1980s the U.S. intent to create an outer space missile shield, which was nicknamed Star Wars after the popular science fiction movie at the time, in which satellites equipped with lasers and anti-missile rockets would be able to shoot down any nuclear missiles the Russians launched, effectively disarming them. And never mind that even today that technology doesn't exist and probably won't exist throughout the near future, the Russians were still scared and getting desperate. Reagan openly referred to the USSR as the evil empire, again in reference to the popular Star Wars trilogy. Remember, Reagan used to be an actor. He loved making references to Hollywood. He also challenged the USSR to tear down the Berlin Wall and prove its peaceful intentions toward the West. Ronald Reagan has never been to the Soviet bloc, but today he stood within yards of it. At his back, the Berlin Wall, a scar he called it, and the Brandenburg Gate. Mr. Reagan had come with a message. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. 
Reagan was beating the USSR up in the press during the 1980s and had made Russians sufficiently fearful of what a rejuvenated and re-energized U.S. could do to Russia. In many ways, Mikhail Gorbachev would be the man, the leader, that Russians had wanted, if not needed. When Gorbachev came to power in 1985, he immediately began scaling back Russia's military expenditures to save his country some money. He de-escalated its nuclear weapons production and slowly began withdrawing troops from Afghanistan. While such measures were appreciated by Russians and Americans alike, he wasn't making the USSR look any stronger in the eyes of its foe, the American government. Gorbachev knew that the USSR could not continue to exist unless some fundamental changes were introduced to his country, and so he created three reforms. He didn't know it at the time, but these three changes would ultimately dismantle communism and the USSR itself. The first was known as Glasnost, which is Russian for openness. Through Glasnost, he removed a great deal of the censorship the Soviet Union had once placed upon artists in the press. Artists were much freer to paint and sing and write, as they liked, without needing the government's approval, without fearing the government's disapproval. For the first time in nearly seven decades, the Russian press was not only free to report unedited versions of news stories, they could even criticize government be Glasnost allowed for more open and honest discussions about the USSR and its policies. The next reform was perestroika. Under Soviet rule, people were actually allowed to own their own business and earn profit from it. They just couldn't employ anyone but themselves. Employing a worker was akin to exploiting him for his labor. So as a result, what Russian private businesses existed under the USSR were usually very small and individually run. Under perestroika, private ownership of business dramatically expanded, allowing people to not only run their own business, but hire other workers. The government removed its quotas and mandates over production and allowed free enterprise to determine what Russian industry would produce. As a result, more and more consumer goods became available to Russians by the end of the 1980s. The last reform was demokratizatsiya, or democratization. Gorbachev allowed other political parties besides the Communist Party to exist and run for public office. Demokratizatsiya allowed for competition in the Communist Party to exist. It allowed people and parties who had different visions and aims for Russia to pitch these to the voting public. Gorbachev had hoped that with these reforms, Glasnost, Perestroika, and Demokratizatsiya, the USSR could peacefully and prosperously return to its pursuit of creating a classless society through socialism. But the best laid plans of mice and men oft go awry. The rapid influence of Western culture under Glasnost and Perestroika, the removal of censorship and imprisonment for expressing one's mind, and the expansion of democracy led to widespread po protests and demonstrations throughout both Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union by the late 1980s, and a demand for the end of communist Russia. In 1991, a coup led by leader Boris Yeltsin and joined in by tens of thousands of political dissidents ranging from angry mothers and grandmothers who had seen their sons and grandsons disappeared by Stalin and Brezhnev, to army veterans upset over their treatment during and after the Afghan war, had arrested and imprisoned Gorbachev in a dacha, a sort of summer home located along the Crimean border. When he was freed later that year, Gorbachev had found that neither the Russian government nor its people were loyal to him. They had been swayed to support the democratic and anti-totalitarian, anti-socialist leanings of Boris Yeltsin. That year, Gorbachev stepped down from leadership of the USSR, and with him, the Soviet Union had come to an end. Boris Yeltsin was the first president ever democratically elected in Russia that year, and the Russian Federation was born. A nation who in the 1990s would for the first time in its history experiment both with democracy and with capitalism. The United States had won the Cold War, not by destroying the Russians in the field of battle, but by first bankrupting them and then allowing them to transform into a sort of Russian version of America, a nation that embraced both democracy and free enterprise. The Russians lost the Cold War 
by becoming like the U.S. The competition between socialism and capitalism, between democracy and totalitarianism, was over. But what the future held for Russia, a nation which had until recently been second only to the United States in wealth, and even more powerful militarily, was anybody's guess.